it's time to begin our service. Before we do, we'll have some announcements. We welcome any visitors here and invite you back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for Bible study. Next Lord's Day morning, 9.30 for Bible study and 10.20 for worship service. I don't know of any sick that's recent, but of course Harold has been fighting his for some time. He's, he, his leg is healing slowly. He's gaining his strength back slowly. So uh, let's keep our prayers and hopes up for him. Sue Stinnett is considering her and I guess the doctor a uh, heart valve replacement. She would like our prayers for the concerning that. That's all I have of any particular individuals, but those in the congregation, a lot of us have our problems and physical and whatever. So anyway, we all need prayers and some undergoing treatments. And so let's keep one another in our prayers. And Keep up with what's going on. Our song leader is Alfred Pritchard. First song is 95. Darren Nellon will have a scripture reading and opening prayer. Our closing prayer is by Riley Rhodes. I mean, Kelly. I don't have my glasses on. Kelly. And the Lord's Supper, Bo Ross with the comments, and Ronnie Thomas assistant. So join in with the worship. <clears throat> Number 95. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Number 20. Number 20. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore Him. Praise Him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before Him. Praise Him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen. 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 
Praise the Lord, for he has spoken. Worlds his mighty voice obeyed. Laws which never shall be broken. For their guidance he hath made. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, for he is glorious. Never shall his promise fail. God has made his saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the God of our salvation. Host on high his power proclaim. Heaven and earth and all creation. Lord, and magnify his name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 621. 621. We'll sing this after we have our scripture reading and our opening prayer. <clears throat> The scripture reading this morning is taken from Romans 1, 1 through 17. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that, you, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God, my witness, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer, making requests if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that, my, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now let's go to the Father in prayer. Our beloved Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for another day of life. Thank you for this time you've given us to come to your house and worship you. I want to pray for all of the sick and say a special prayer for Sue Stennett with the decision she's got to make. And if she chooses to do the surgery, we pray that you will be with the surgeon and guide their hands. I want to say a special prayer for all of the Christians in Ukraine that are being punished. I pray that you will be with them, help them. And dear God, we thank you again for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> if it's convenient, let's all stand, please. 621. <coughs> Oh, listen to our wondrous story, counted once among the lost. Yet one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cost. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? Can heaven intercede? No angel could his place have taken, highest of the high though he. The loved one on the cross forsaken, was one of the Godhead three. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. Will you surrender to this Savior, to his scepter humbly bow? You too shall come to know his favor, he will save you, save you now. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. Be seated. Mark your books to number 562. 562 will be our song of encouragement. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see all of you out today. Thankful for your presence. And as was mentioned, any visiting, we're very thankful that you're here. If you have any questions about the things that we say or do today, please feel free to ask. You won't hurt our feelings. You won't make us mad. Be glad to talk to you about anything that we do here and explain it from the scriptures. Um, today is uh, Easter, and it's, it's kind of like Christmas. It's one of those bittersweet things for me. I, I have really enjoyed seeing uh, around neighborhoods and places going through towns of people thinking about the resurrection of Jesus. That's the plus side. The, the downside is, why would you just do that once a year? <laughs> uh, I, this is something that needs to be considered and, and thought about every day of the year. Uh, the word Easter, as far as I know, is only present in the King James Version, the 1611 version of the, the King James Version of the Bible. In, in other translations, in that passage, it's translated Passover, uh, the Jewish holiday. And so uh, it's not something that we see early Christians celebrating the, the resurrection once a year in a special celebration. Uh, rather, they, we know that they gathered every first day of the week to remember the death of the Lord. And I hope that we all remember the resurrection every day. I mean, there's no hope if there's no resurrection. If you, don't, if you haven't thought about that, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just read that chapter. It won't take you very long. And, and Paul talks about, here's what's true if Jesus was raised from the dead. 
here's what's true if he didn't. And uh, basically, our entire existence hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus. So I want to talk about not just Jesus' resurrection today, but the gospel story. We're going to examine the gospel story and think about it as a whole. And I hope that all of us will pick up from the scriptures that which makes Jesus' life and the gospel story so important. It is the most important thing that we'll ever be exposed to in our lives. And how we react to it will determine not just our life here, but beyond the grave, our eternal destiny. So as we start thinking about the nature of the gospel, go back and think about as Jesus uh, died, was buried, rose again, and he came and he gave his apostles some last instructions before he, dis- he would ascend all the way back to heaven. And those are recorded in Mark chapter 16 and in Matthew 28. And if you think about those instructions, it, it kind of uh, is a prelude to the rest of the gospel message and then what's going to happen in, in Acts. Uh, he said, remember, he's, he's risen from the dead and he's getting ready to go back to heaven. These are among the last words that he says to his apostles. And he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world. There's your territory. Preach. There's the action that I expect of you. The gospel. Here is the the limit of the scope of what you will preach. So nothing is off limits as far as territory. Everything's off limits when it comes to what you're going to be preaching except the gospel. Uh, If you want to look at it in uh, Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 28, he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. I think the King James says teach. And the word literally means to disciple, to disciple others. Make disciples of all the nations. Well, obviously... You preach to all the world if you're going to make disciples of all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So there again, it's my commands. That's what you're limited to. Now he said, preach the gospel. If somebody just walked up to you and said, what's the gospel? What would your answer be? Have you got something ready? Have you thought about it? I don't know if anybody will, but I hope they do. I hope somebody walks up to you and says, now you talk about the gospel. What's the gospel? What are you going to say? You got something in your hip pocket ready? We better. I mean, the gospel is the good news. That's what gospel literally means. Good news. Good tidings. Glad tidings. So what are they? Well, Paul sort of summarizes them when you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which to me is... uh, the, the, the greatest resource on the resurrection and, and life after death in all the New Testament, probably. But he, he says there uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 3, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, back up here. He starts this chapter, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you're saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So look, first of all, at the the power of the gospel. This is what Paul preached. This is what the Corinthians believed. This is what they will continue to remain saved and in the right relationship with God. It's all according to the gospel. And the gospel, he sums up pretty quickly. He says there that that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, Jews would have been completely familiar with this. Messiah was coming. He was going to uh, present a way for sins to be saved. I don't know that they had in their mind He Himself was going to die on the cross. But that's the way it was going to play out. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Over and over... You know, it was shown that that would happen. And Jesus himself said that you people ask for a sign and no sign is going to be given to you except the sign of Jonah because like Jonah was uh, three nights in the, in the belly of the great fish. 
so the Son of Man will be three nights in the heart of the earth. And so this had all been prophesied, whether it was uh, from Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel or one of the other prophets, or whether it was prophesied by Jesus Himself. It was according to the Scriptures. And He wasn't just buried. He rose again the third day, as the Scriptures said that He would, and then He was seen. And if you continue there in 1 Corinthians 15, it says He was seen by Cephas, another name for the Apostle Peter. Then He was seen by the twelve, the, the group of which Peter was a part. And then He was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So this is the list of witnesses after He was the risen Savior. And that, that's kind of the gospel. That's kind of the good news in a nutshell. Because if people ask you, what is the gospel? You need to be able to talk to them about the fact that, okay, we're in sin. Sin's a transgression of God's will. And we don't have any way out of that. You know, if you, if you were a Jew and you lived under the Old Covenant, every year, you know, you'd pick out this beautiful lamb that didn't have any spots and was perfect and everything, and you would kill that animal bring it to the priest and sacrifice it for sin. And then that time next year, you do the same thing. And you would do it every year for all of your life until you die. And it still wouldn't atone for your sin. We needed a sacrifice. If you're going to talk to people about the gospel, talk about sin and talk about we needed a sacrifice. Animals didn't do it. The book of Hebrews talks about the nature of the animal sacrifices. Go and read about them. And they, they, that's God's plan to bring people up to the point where Jesus comes, but they weren't sufficient in and of themselves. They were a stopgap measure that God put in place until He brought the promised Messiah. And so we need a Savior. And the Savior came and died, I think, to a lot of people's surprise, even chagrin. But that was the plan from the beginning. That sacrifice was needed, but that sacrifice would mean nothing if Jesus was still in the grave. And so He was raised up. And He gives all of us who go to Him and take Him as a sacrifice hope to be raised up as well. Now, what's the greatest fear mankind can have? You know, The worst thing that can happen to you is what? <laughs> Death. That's as bad as it gets. I mean, there's no coming back from that, right? And Jesus says, what if I could get rid of that fear too? And He did. And He was the first, the first ever to come back from death and never die again. And He's promised that to everyone else. And that's, that's the Gospel. Death, burial, resurrection according to the Scriptures, and being seen by others as a proof. Now, I want to talk about this from Romans 1. These all start with a P. This wasn't original with me. Some other guy did it and I liked it, all right? This is completely plagiarized. There you go. <clears throat> now all my lawyers say I'm okay. <laughs> but the fact that all these points start with a P, I think, helps to, to remember why this is so important. And Romans 1 points out a lot of things here that we may miss if we just, you know, read through it real quick. In Romans chapter 1, and thanks to Theron for reading all of that, look at, at verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be a what? An apostle. What's an apostle? The word literally means one sent, generally one sent with a message it was a very generic term. You could be sent uh, on a variety of missions. It could be as simple as to, to gather firewood. It could be as complex as delivering a message of war or peace to a king. I mean, everything in between. But it means you've been chosen, you've been given a, a message, a task, and you are to accomplish it. Paul says, I'm an apostle separated to the gospel of God. He's been chosen and He's been sent with a message. Okay, we're going to talk about more, more of that in just a moment. He says, uh, separated to the gospel of God, which He promised before through His prophets 
in the Holy Scriptures. When you think about the gospel, it is a promised gospel. Paul says that in verses 1 and 2. He's separated to the gospel. He's an apostle of it. It was promised through the prophets. Everybody's familiar with the sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. But we don't read as much the continuation of that while he's still in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 3. But I want you to notice what he says there in Acts 3. The apostle Peter still preaching here. He says, Mo- Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Now, remember, Paul says that the gospel was promised through the prophets. Peter goes back to Moses. Let us sing the books of Moses. Does that ring a bell? Genesis through Deuteronomy. Moses promised. Moses prophesied and he said, the Lord's going to raise up a prophet like me. So all the way back in Genesis, we find out that Jesus is coming. The Mo- Moses and all the prophets, he continues here, uh, and that it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So Moses talked about Jesus. Go back and read about it in Genesis chapter 3. And then in verse 24, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. So what prophets gave a hint that Jesus was coming? (laughs) What prophets didn't? He says all the prophets... That was their job. And and he criticizes them because they're the sons of the prophets. They should know this. It was a promised gospel. It was a prepared gospel. As you continue here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, Jesus came as in the lineage of King David, and it was foretold that through this line, all nations of the earth were going to be blessed. You remember, this goes all the way back to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham soon to be 100, Sarah soon to be 90 years old, and the Lord says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land I'll show you. I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, did did Abraham's descendants, was there a descendant that, that influenced everybody personally on the earth? I, I doubt that. But there was a descendant that was coming that had the potential to influence every person on all the earth of all time. That's what was coming. And Jesus was going to be the fulfillment of that promise. This had been prepared by God. Remember, this wasn't just something that happened. This is one of the things that bothers me so much about the premillennial theory that is postulated by so many people. It it seems to me that, and there's a lot of variations of it, but it seems to me that so many times it denigrates the church and uh, the method that God has put in place to save people to a plan B, something that Jesus just had to do because His first measure didn't work. He couldn't set up a kingdom on earth because people wouldn't accept Him, so... uh, I'll just, I'll wait till later and I'll start a kingdom. That's not, that's not the Savior. That's not the mighty king. Look at this, Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 6. Paul says, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Do you realize God was at work before He said, Let there be light? Before He created 
the, the, the earth and the sun, the moon and the stars and everything that we know. Before that, God was at work. Before the foundation of the world, He said, there, there are a people that I, that I want. I, this is what I want all people to be. And He was choosing us be out of love. And, and He says that this is to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. This plan that's always been in place, it glorifies God and it, it beautiful, it's beautiful. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, Peter says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now listen to him. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. This was all prepared, folks. There's nothing about Jesus and the plan of salvation that was ever, you know, second, plan B, whatever you want to call it. It was all prepared ahead of time. That's what the gospel message is about. It's a proven gospel. This is, one, this is one of the beauties of the gospel. It's not a theory. It's the gospel truth. In, uh, in verse 4 here of Romans chapter 1. Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. When I was in high school, I took a vocational auto mechanics class. 1,080 hours that I didn't have to go to other classes. I said, sign me up. All right? And all of us in there, we all had hot rods. I had a 68 Chevelle with a 327, 300 horse, four bolt main, and all that stuff, you know. And so all of us guys, we would uh, pull our cars in and we would work on them, you know, as part of this class. I mean, does it get any better than that? <laughs> And so all of us, you know, we, we had these things fine-tuned to where, and back then you could do things to engines. And they were just running top-notch. And we would all brag about our vehicles, our engines, and all the work that we had done. But in the vocational auto mechanics class, there were located over here these two huge rollers. And what those were for you could pull your car onto there and then those rollers would come up and you could put your car in gear and start it and it was called a dynamometer. I think that's the word, isn't it? Dyno. And that would give an actual reading about what your car is putting out to the wheels. All right? All of us could brag all we wanted about all the work that we'd done to our vehicles. This was a not subjective, an objective measurement of what we did. That was the truth. And the guy that had the highest reading on the dyno, he was the one that got all the glory and the praise. Why, do I, why am I talking about that? Because the resurrection is not something subjective that you say... It's this, that, or the other. It says here, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. You know what the death dynamometer is? It's can you come back to life. And everybody has hit zero except Jesus went ding, 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 ding. And God brought him back to life and that's the power. He has declared to be the Son of God with power, and the, the reading is the resurrection from the dead. All right? The gospel is proven. All the prophets talked about this one that would come. Jesus said, I'd be, I'll be in the, uh, the heart of the earth three nights. He said, destroy this temple. I'll build it back in three days. All of that's talk. Talk is cheap. The resurrection is where Jesus puts His money where His mouth is. It's where He's declared to be the Son of God with power. It's the powerful proof that separates the Gospel from everything else. You know, all the mystics of the East, they know nothing of the resurrection. 
the philosophies, the philosophies of men. If you take a philosophy course in college and you bring up the resurrection, you're going to be laughed out of the class and you're going to fail and the teacher's going to uh, humiliate you. All right? And the denominational world de-emphasizes the resurrection to where a lot of people don't even believe that it's real. And the Bible says it is the most powerful thing that's ever happened on this earth. You like watching Frankenstein? He makes a lightning bolt, brings some spare parts back to life. That's all just a bunch of junk. But the resurrection is real. And Jesus not only came back to life, He said, now that I've done it and I'm going back to heaven, I have the power to do it for you if you'll come and get the gift. It is a preached gospel. If you'll notice in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name. Now, I brought up that word apostle earlier. Here he talks about apostleship. If you have been given apostleship, what, what do you have? You've got a mission. You've got a mission to go and preach. And that's the thing. This message has to be preached. It was always God's plan that it be preached. And one of the things, and I'm just throwing this in. This won't cost you a bit extra. But anyway, in verse 5, he talks about obedience to the faith. That's something you won't hear in most religious circles. Because most people think obedience and faith are mutually exclusive. Now, here's, here's a phrase that Paul uses, and he says, obedience to the faith. He merges obedience and faith, and it's not just one time. In fact, uh, I think Kyle Cassidy was the first one that use this term. He heard it from somebody else. But he talked about this as the bookends of Romans. Isn't this interesting? In Romans 1 and verse 5, he talks about obedience to the faith. If you have Bibles, if you'll turn them over to Romans 16, Romans 1 is the first chapter. Romans 16 is the last chapter. In chapter 16 and verse 26, what does he say? Now he's been made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. The book of Romans begins and ends with obedience to the faith. He merges those things that almost the entire religious world claims is mutually exclusive. And the thing is, you can't be obedient to the faith unless what? you got to know what the faith is. And you can't know what the faith is unless it's preached, unless it's taught, unless it comes to you. And that's why we read Matthew 28, make disciples of all the nations. That's why we read Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Here's a couple other passages, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> you therefore, my son, Paul says to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me. So what went on between Paul and Timothy? Paul taught Timothy. The things you have heard from me among many witnesses. So Paul didn't just teach Timothy. There, there was a lot of other people when he taught. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And this is how the gospel message is perpetuated. I teach you. You teach your neighbor. Your neighbor teaches their neighbor. And it grows, and usually exponentially. All right? Um, here's another passage, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul says, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. I write so that you may know how. We don't know how unless somebody tells us, right? And that's the, that's the beauty of the gospel, but the gospel must be preached. It's like having the cure for cancer and keeping it in your own possession. Can you imagine? That, that's that's criminal, isn't it? But how many of us know the gospel? We know the gospel story. 
and we just keep it to ourselves. That's one reason if you, if, if you see me out on the street, and you will, I'm the crazy guy out there by myself talking to nobody. That's why I'm doing it. I mean, I've stood in the pulpit most of my adult life. I've had Bible studies in houses, and I don't know what else to do. So now I'm just talking to anybody that'll listen. Because the gospel has got to be heard in order to be obeyed. It's got to be preached. And the thing is, the gospel's pressing. When I, I told Deanne the first time I was going out to just stand in front of the Piggly Wiggly and talk, she said, what are you going to talk about? I said, well, I've decided I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ being, being killed and being raised again and, and that he died for our sins. And she said, well, how'd you choose that? I said, well, because to me, that story demands a verdict. <laughs> I mean, you can't just hear that and have no opinion. It's like, it's like uh, watching the, the uh, Japanese being bombed in, in Hiroshima or Nagasaki and saying, eh. I mean, you can't just say, eh. you've got to have an opinion. All right? You have to have an opinion about this. It presses on us. It's a pressing gospel. In verse 8, he says, First I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all, you obedient Christians in Rome, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Okay? You heard the message, and the verdict that you rendered was, I have faith in this message. I believe. And then in verse 12, he says, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and of me. Again, he talks about their faith. Confronted by the gospel, it, it causes us to be pressed to respond. Either respond in faith or respond in re rejection, uh, doubt, uh, being, I, I don't know. You, you choose the reaction. But it has to cause a reaction. You don't just say, meh. Not to Jesus on the cross. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. About that time there arose a great commotion about the way. Okay, that's another name for Jesus Christ and the disciples of Jesus Christ. A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, an idol brought no small profit to the craftsmen who called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Okay, these are people that build little Diana shrines and they sell them and say, come get your shrines, come on, come on, get your idols, five bucks a piece. And that's how they make their money. And here comes Paul saying, there's only one God, Diana's not real, there's only one God that created all things. And this guy says, do you understand what's happening here? We have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only this, is our, this trade of ours is in danger of fa falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificent destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were full of wrath and began to cry out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. It causes a reaction, okay? You are pressed to respond. You remember in Acts chapter 26 and uh, verses 27 and 28, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And Agrippa said, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. I had a lesson a week or two ago about the fact, or a devotion or something, or I was talking to some, I don't know. And sometime I was talking about this guy. All right? There's, there's a reaction here. If you say, I might do this later, you have reacted. Do you, you understand that the entire idea of putting something off is making a decision? You've made a decision. If you say, I'm going to diet on Monday, <laughs> and, 
And it's because today is Tuesday. You've made a decision, all right? You've decided to put off till tomorrow. And that's what he did. And the, the gospel is going to cause a decision. In Isaiah 6, that's what the sermon was about last week. I'm sure about that. Isaiah 6, Isaiah talked about uh, the fact that God had sent him on a mission where people wouldn't see what he was talking about, where they wouldn't hear what he was talking about, and where their hearts would not be influenced by what he was preaching about. That's the mission he sent him on. You go over to Acts 28 and verse 24. Some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. And then Paul quoted from Isaiah chapter 6. Some were persuaded and some did not. But the gospel causes a reaction. That's why it's so important that the gospel message is given. I, I've been telling people here lately, look, if you don't want to believe in the gospel, that's your business. But would you please let your kids make up their own mind? Let them have the gospel and let them decide whether they want it or not. That's the least we can do. The gospel is powerful. We've already talked some about the power of the resurrection. Look at verses 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Do you remember earlier when I was talking about the dynamometer, the dynamo, the dyno? Did you know that this word right here uh, in verse 16, it's the power of God to salvation? The Greek word that that is translated from is the word dunamis. Power, dynamite. It's where we get our word dyno, dynamometer. It's where we get our word dynamite. All of those words all had to do with power. That comes from the Greek word dunamis, which is used in Romans 1 and verse 16. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And in verse 17, it's the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is a verse that I think most of us have not taken the time to really explore and understand. I'm not saying that to say that I've got some kind of insight that you don't. This just occurred to me in recent years. There's more than one way to take that, the just shall live by faith. And so to, to discover it, you've got to go back to where it was first quoted, Habakkuk chapter 2 and in verse 4. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. It is a true Bible principle, like Paul talks about in the Corinthians, that we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about the difference between being dead and being alive, and the difference is faith. Okay, The just shall live by his faith as opposed to dying because he doesn't have it. That's, what, that's the context of this verse. So when we get to like Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, <clears throat> the Hebrew writer, Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This isn't talking about your everyday walk that you walk by faith. This is talking about if you live, you'll live by your faith. The just shall live by faith as opposed to dying in the absence of it. That's the context of the verse here. That's the power of faith that only comes through the gospel message. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 18 beginning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Isn't that amazing? You can look at something and, and one group of people say the cross is foolishness. I've had plenty of people over my lifetime tell me it's foolishness, the Bible's a bunch of tales, and only a fool would believe it. And, now, and then I have brethren who... who have built their entire lives and are putting all their eggs in one basket when it comes to eternity and saying, 
I, I've gone to the cross to have my sins forgiven, and heaven's my eternal destiny because the Bible tells me that. And that's the, that's the two viewpoints. And, and if you are in the, in the category of thinking that this is not the Word of God, that it's just made up, that men have written it, that whatever, please get with me because there is plenty of proof if we were in a courtroom, this thing would, end, would win hands down because of the preponderance of evidence of its uh, originality, of its authenticity, that it comes from God. That makes it a powerful message. But the, the last thing I want to say is that the gospel is personal. Did you notice that in verse 16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Now, if you read you know, the Facebook column or you read the obituary, the world today says, all you have to do is die and you go to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven when they die. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's not what the Bible says. The good news is everybody can go to heaven. It's possible for everyone to go to heaven. There's nobody exempted from this. Anybody that wants to go can go. And the way is to believe in Christ. And belief always means obedient belief. But without that, we don't have that hope. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. Think about this verse in relationship to the subject. Who does God say? The husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He's the Savior of the body. Now we know from Ephesians chapter 1 that the body and the church are one and the same. Ephesians 1, uh, 22 and 23. Okay? So Christ is the Savior of the body. He's the Savior of the church. And we know that the Lord adds to the church all those who are being saved. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. All right? Now, if, if God saves everybody in the body or everybody in the church, what if I'm not in the body? This verse doesn't get me saved, does it? Because it says He's the Savior of the body, the church. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Though He was a son, this is talking about Jesus. Though He was a son, yet He learned obedience by the things which He suffered. And having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Now see, most people just leave off those last three words. They just say Jesus became the author of salvation to all. But the verse says Jesus saves all who obey Him. What if I don't obey Him? This verse doesn't give me any hope, does it? It, it, it doesn't tell me I'm going to be saved. Think about James chapter 2. Beginning in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So anytime the Bible says that we're saved by believing, it always is talking about obedient faith, and there's plenty of other passages to talk about that. If you think I've misrepresented any of this, or you're not clear about any of these things, please get with me. I'm easy to find. If you're in steel, they'll point you right to my house. If you're somewhere else, there's e my email address and my phone number and everything else. It's easy to get a hold of me. If, if I'm wrong, tell me. If, if you don't understand, let me talk to you more. But if these things hit you where I'm aiming, right in the heart, and I've proven them from the Scriptures, then why would any of us not go to that powerful sacrifice? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the Gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. If I'm willing to confess my faith in Jesus and say, I've got sin, Jesus is the answer, I have faith 
that His sacrifice will save me from my sin. I want to be baptized in His name. That's where I contact the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from my sin. That's where I'm born again. And that's where I begin my life, my new life, in Him. I sent somebody a text the other day because it popped up on my calendar. It was the day that they had been baptized, the day that they decided to take the blood of Jesus as a sacrifice for their sins. And I said, happy spiritual birthday. And I thought, oh man, doesn't that trump just being born? You know, you didn't have any choice to be born, but you do have a choice to follow Jesus. If we can help you in that in any way, please let us know right now while we stand and sing. Heal at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice, leave with Him your care, and begin life anew.